Loved ones, uh, these are about the last two or three evenings of our studies in the spiritual life during this winter, fall and winter and springtime. And tonight I'd like to try to speak once more on the crisis experience of the cross and then next Sunday on the process experience of the cross. And they both deal with separate issues. So let's try to concentrate tonight on the crisis experience of the cross. And maybe if you have a Bible, you'd look to Matthew chapter 6, and you could see the issue expressed in words that we haven't normally used in our own studies. And yet all through Scripture, you get the same truth taught in different ways. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then you can see the kind of life described that many of us live who have not entered into the crisis experience of the cross in the few verses above, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And another translation is, if your eye be single, your whole body is full of light. And normally the problem with those of us who have not entered into the crisis experience of the cross is that our eyes are not single, and therefore our bodies are not filled with light. And we have a mixture of light and darkness in us. And it's because we have not accepted or experienced the crisis work of the cross in our lives. Really, I could uh, illustrate it like this. We have in the basement two very large furnaces or boilers. Oh, each one is almost the size of that whole stage area, both in height and in breadth and length, every way. Two very large old furnaces. And they were both used for coal burning. And that's the way they heated this whole building in the past. What has happened now is that one of them has been converted to a gas oil-burning furnace, and that's the one we depend on at the moment. And the other one is sitting there still untouched, still in the uh, form that it was when they burned coal. Now, many of us are in this situation. We're like the old burner or the old furnace that has not been remodeled. It's really manufactured and designed to burn coal. But we're trying to burn oil in it. And it just isn't working, because it wasn't designed for oil. And we have received the oil of the Holy Spirit, we have asked Jesus to send his Spirit into our hearts. And the very fact that we're here this evening proves that the Spirit of Jesus is within us. But we're now involved in trying to burn the oil of the Holy Spirit in a furnace that has not been remodeled. And so it, it is just a mess. The oil of the Spirit is not burning satisfactorily within us. And it is not giving any heat or any light or any power to anyone else. It's just lying there inside us. And actually, we're beginning to feel more and more frustrated because of that. And the reason is, loved ones, that we have not accepted the once and for all irrevocable redesigning that God did upon us in Jesus. Because the truth is, that we once were meant to burn oil. We were meant to live off the oil of God's Spirit. Now, I know I've said this so often before, 
But loved ones, pray that the Holy Spirit would bring it home to you in a real way. We were made to be utterly satisfied with our God. Now, I know it's so hard for us to hear those words because we have so much strong teaching that we cannot do without each other, and I know we're precious to each other. But any of you, I, I know some brothers here who have lost dear wives who were with them throughout their lives, and they know full well that finally you have to part with even the sweetest frame. You have to part with the dearest human being that you've ever known. And so there are many of us here, even those of us who have lost dads and mums, we know in our heart of hearts that human friendship will not last simply because we are all temporary and transient. And yet it's so hard for us to face the fact that we were really made to live off God's friendship and that alone. We really were, loved ones. And I know, you know, you brothers and sisters who aren't married, it's so easy for you to say, oh, but God can't cuddle me, God can't cuddle me, and God can't kiss me, and God can't squeeze me. Well, really, you know, it's not the cuddling and the kissing and the squeezing that finally matters as the years pass. In fact, most of us realize the cuddling and the kissing and the squeezing can mean lots of other things besides love. But it's the love inside that matters. And yes, God can love you. And God can give you the sense of importance and the sense of preciousness far more than anybody else actually can. And we were meant to live off God's friendship. And we were meant to get all our sense of importance from him and all our sense of enjoyment from him. And it is possible, if you read the dear old saints that Jim was referring to earlier on, if you read them in relationship to their prayer lives, you will find that they, well, you, you know it from the Song of Solomon, that in trying to describe the joy and the exhilaration that they have in their prayer relationship with God, they lift into language that we would normally regard as connected with a sexual relationship and connected with human affection. They always lift into that realm. They begin to talk in terms that the love songs talk in. And really, it's all the more indication that we were meant to get our whole affection and our whole exhilaration and our whole joy of being known deeply and thoroughly from our dear God and our Father. And we were meant to get our whole sense of security from him and our whole sense of, us, of recognition and acknowledgement and significance from him. And of course, we've said so often that what we have done is we've given up that relationship and we've turned to the world and other people for that. And so instead of being oil burners, we're now old coal burners. And we're trying to get the sense of affection and sense of significance by making ourselves important in some boyfriend's life or some girlfriend's life or anybody's life, some roommate's life, some, some peer group's life, anybody. We, we'll go to anybody. We'll go to the Lions Club if they'll give us a sense of importance and a sense of significance. Anybody, it's strange, isn't it? We'll settle even for stuff that we know is cheap, you know. We'll settle for, for recognition that is cheap, and we know it means nothing. We'll even become efficient at our secretarial work and our typing to see if somehow we can make ourselves indispensable to the boss or indispensable to somebody. And yet we know they're not loving us for ourselves, but it's strange we'll go to anybody to make up for this emptiness that we feel as far as affection and recognition and importance is concerned. And of course, we'll go to the money and the jobs for our sense of security. And so really, instead of depending on God himself inside for our sense of security and significance and happiness, instead of burning oil the way we were meant to, we've started to burn coal, and we've got so dependent on people and things to give us our sense of security and our sense of significance and our sense of happiness that even though we've now received the oil of the Holy Spirit within us, even though we know God loves us, yet we still are the old coal-burning type of furnace. We haven't allowed ourselves to be remodeled. And that's why we have such trouble. God whispers to us, 
It doesn't matter whether they think you're slick or a swinger. You don't need to laugh at that dirty joke. You don't need to. It doesn't matter what they think of you. I think you're the very apple of my eye. My love is all you need. Doesn't matter whether they think you're a square or not. Don't laugh at the joke. But the old personality is so programmed, it is so designed over years and years, not only of your life, but of Adam's life, because we have inherited the image of the man of dust. We've inherited a personality that works from the outside in, that the old smile is on our lips. We reckon, well, we won't really smile, we won't really laugh at the joke, we'll just smile so that they notice we're not too different from the rest. And, of course, we smile at the dirty joke, and we lose all the sense of the glory of God that was coming upon us. That's what I mean, loved ones. We have the Spirit of Jesus within us. We're bringing the oil in in gallons, but the furnace has not been redesigned. It's still a personality that works from the outside in. It's still a personality that lives from the body inwardly. And that's, you remember, what uh, God says in Ephesians, if you would just turn to it briefly. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, uh, just to get the continuity of the, the statement in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, "...and you he made alive." And many of us, you see, have been made alive. We've come alive. We've received the Spirit of Jesus. When you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's what it means. We all lived in the passions of our flesh. We so often, you see, eliminate that by thinking, oh, great sexual lust. Well, that's not it. The passions of the flesh are all the desires to get attention through our body uh, because of our appearance, to get food and satisfaction and freedom from anxiety through our mouths and our stomachs. It's trying to get from the outside in the security and the significance and the happiness that we need. And we've been so used to that for so long that now, even though we have the Spirit of Jesus within us, we find that the Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the Spirit. We don't want to laugh at the dirty joke, but we're so used to it for years doing that that the personality drives us to. And yet the Spirit of Jesus within us is driving the other way, and there's a great conflict that prevents us from doing what we would. And the only answer, loved ones, is to have a total redesigning of your personality, a total remodeling. And that's what happened on the cross. It's Romans 6. That's what happened on the cross. Romans 6. And it's such an, a, a verse that we've repeated continuously, and yet I'd have to say, you know, that if it's real in your life, your heart will rise to it because it'll be spirit and life to you however often you read it. Verse 6 of Romans 6, we know that our old self, our old personality, our old in turn perverted personality that lived as a parasite of the world and of people and things, that old self was crucified with him. It was done away with. So that the sinful body, which is really the body of sin, you see, the body, our, we use our bodies to get freedom from anxiety. That's, that's what we do. We either take the pills or we take the alcohol or we eat uh, a big meal or anything to get free from anxiety and worry. Or we use our bodies with each other people, others, to look well and to gain attention and to gain other people's recognition so that our old sinful body might be destroyed. And you remember what it means, rendered inoperative, left unemployed. So good. Our old self, our old personality that worked from the outside in was crucified with Christ so that the body might be left unemployed. It's like us, we would be able to say to the body, body, we don't need the security, significance, and happiness that you can give us anymore. We don't need it. We don't need it. You're uh, out of work. That's it. You're unemployed. 
so that the body of sin might be unemployed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin, which tries to get security, significance, and happiness from people and things other than God. Now, that's what we have to experience. And that's what we mean when we say the crisis experience of the cross. It's you saying, Lord, I really want that with all my heart. And I know a lot of you are saying, I want it, but do you see that there are two meanings that we give to the English word want? One is, I want more ice cream. And that is, I desire more ice cream. And it's obvious that if you see the kind of life that can be lived through Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, of course we want it. So many of us mistake that, and we think we mean I'm willing for it when we say, I want that. But what you need to be able to say is, I'm willing for that. And loved ones, that's what is needed. A willingness to no longer serve two masters. That's really what it is. It's a deep down willingness to deal with all the areas in your life where you're trying to get security apart from God. Every one of them. Right? The job uh, other people, uh, your own talents, your own abilities, uh, the economic system, the kind of future and training that you've planned for yourself, it means a willingness to die to that, once and for all to die to it, to stop serving that master. It means a willingness to be crucified with Jesus as far as other people's approbation is concerned. And you know what it must have meant for him to hang on the cross and see Mary, his mother, looking up at him and thinking he was a failure. Now, I remember it coming to the time in my life when I know God was asking me to die to what my relatives or my friends thought of me back home. And that's part of the crucifixion. Being willing to die to the significance and the importance and the attention that other people give to you, it's refusing to serve that master any longer. That's the master that produces jealousy and envy and pride inside you. And then as far as happiness is concerned, you think how often we are the playthings of happiness. You think of how often you have trouble deciding what to do because it's a choice between your happiness and God's will. It's a choice between getting what you think will make you happy and doing what you think will be enjoyable to do and doing God's will. And really, it brings incredible unhappiness to you, that striving and that splitting of your personality at that moment. And being crucified with Christ means being willing to die to any happiness but God alone. Really, that's a very sacred place to come to, loved ones. Will you kneel down in the darkness with your Lord and you say, Lord God, if you don't give me happiness, I'm willing to do without happiness for the rest of my life. No longer will I go over after what I enjoy just for the sake of enjoying it. From now on, Lord, if you give me happiness, that's what I want. Everything else I will count as refuse for the sake of knowing your happiness and your enjoyment in my life. And so coming to that place is what we mean by the crisis experience of the cross. Because here's the truth. You can't change your own personality. You can't. You can't change your own personality. And that's, that's the fallacy. Do you see that in Christendom? The fallacy of Christendom is we receive the Spirit of Jesus into us, and then, with his help, we rewrite our personalities. You can't. You can't. That's why you have such continual sense of defeat because you're again and again trying to rewrite your own personality with the Holy Spirit's help. Now, the glorious truth is that that is another miracle that God has worked in Christ. He has crucified your old self. He has already done it. You and all that you have been and all that you hope to be have been destroyed in Jesus, finished once and for all. It's already done. And it's not something that you have to laboriously try to do. But you see, what a lot of us are doing is we're stepping back from the cross in fear. And we're saying, that is too radical a remedy, but I shall work on this. And so we get the old knife and <laughs> we try to cut off that hand because it's causing us trouble. And a little bit of pride, so we try to poke the old knife in and 
lift the pride out. And of course, the beauty of it all is we're still in control of the knife, so we can only cut as much as we want. And we never get to the point where we're free from this old, outdated, perverted personality. And you can never do it. The truth is that God has done it in Jesus, and anything that God has done in Jesus can be done in you at a moment. Because all that God has done is received into our lives by faith. And faith is simply believing that God has done it and a willingness to have him do it. And I don't know where the problem is with you, but I think for most of us it's a willingness. For most of us, it's an unwillingness to have him do whatever he wants to do. We all kind of feel, oh, we don't mind growing in grace because that puts the growing into, under our control. But we don't like the idea of putting ourselves on an operating table and say, go ahead, Lord, whatever you want. And that's really what being crucified with Christ is about. Now, what I'd just like to share in the last few minutes is three misconceptions that I think we have. The, the first one, loved ones, you'll find Romans 6 and 11. Romans 6 and 11. Three misconceptions of how to enter into this crisis experience of, of crucifixion with Christ. Romans 6 and 11. It's page 981. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Faith, not experience. So some of us, after we receive Jesus' Spirit, begin to see His Spirit exposing to us our jealousy and our pride. Indeed, especially if we ask the Holy Spirit to do this, he will allow us to fall even more heavily and more repeatedly than we were before. And so we will see more and more the poverty of our own life. And we will see more and more what ridiculous, jealous, proud gods we are. We will see more clearly how ugly we are. And if you keep your eyes on your experience, you will never enter into the experience of dying with Jesus. Because once you put your eyes on your experience, it's clear to God that you're determined to do this by human effort. And the only way you can ever have him work a miracle in you is by first believing his word. And so the only way the Holy Spirit is able, ever going to bring you into your crucifixion with Christ is if you believe his word. And his word says you have already been crucified with Christ. And you should be clear about this, loved ones. It's not a matter of auto-suggestion. It's not that you think yourself into being crucified with Christ. It's not that you say, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And therefore, that's how death will be real in you. But the fact is, that unless you set your eyes on the simple fact that 1,900 years ago, God crucified you with Christ, unless you continually approach God from the basis of his own word, and you reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, unless you do that, God is withheld from making it real by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, do you see that? It's not that through the very act of believing, you somehow make it real by the power of positive thinking. It is simply that by the act of believing and setting your faith on God's Word, you free God to begin to make the thing real in your life. So just remember that you always have to approach your God on the basis of His Word. So God says our old self was crucified with Christ, your anger and your bad temper yesterday says you weren't. You have to choose which you believe. You have to choose whether you walk by sight or whether you walk by faith. You have to choose, is it true that I have been crucified with Christ? That that is true. Maybe the reality of it isn't in my life. Maybe I'm not even letting the reality of it be true in my life. But is it a fact? that as far as God is concerned, I've been destroyed with Jesus. And the fact is that as far as God is concerned, yes, that's true. That's the only reason he was willing to let us have the Holy Spirit, because he'd already flooded us all out in a cosmic flood in Jesus and destroyed us there. And he's already made us anew. And that's the only reason he gives us the Holy Spirit, 
He knows it would be mockery to give the Holy Spirit to a group of people who were still running in the old, undesigned, unremodeled personality that they had before. The only reason God is willing to give his Holy Spirit to the world is that he has destroyed us all in Jesus. And loved ones, the first step is faith, not experience. It's siding with God. It's siding with his word against yourself. It's siding with the assurance of his word against even what you know, what you see. And you know it's true. Abraham did not consider his age. He did not consider the age of, of Sarah or of her, of her womb. He did not consider that, but he believed God. He did not look on what his eyes could see, but he believed what God had said had already taken place. So it is with us. The only possibility of entering into this experience is if you walk by faith. And loved ones, don't you say to me, you know, oh, you're, you're not being real. Of course you're being real. That's the only way you're healed. You're not healed because you see the arm will move. No. You're healed by faith that this arm has already been healed in Jesus. And then the symptom is expressed in your life. So it's true all the way. God says to the people of Israel, I have given Jericho into your hands. Well, what if, if, all the, if Joshua and all the others had looked at Jericho and said, no, you haven't. There it is, standing firm. The walls are stout and strong. But he didn't. He said, I accept that, Lord, that you have already given Jericho into our hands. I believe that. And now we're only walking around these walls just because you tell us to. It has nothing to do with the walls falling down. The walls are already down as far as you're concerned. We're just obeying you to show that we trust you. So it is in this experience of crucifixion with Christ. The first step is faith, not experience. Second uh, thing that it would be good to look at, loved ones, is John 16 and verse 13. John 16 and verse 13. And it's in those words that Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit. And the things that that dear spirit will do. John 16 and verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Revelation, not introspection. So you take the position, Father, I believe that I was crucified with Christ. Lord, I believe it. I believe it. I hold to that with my mind. Now, Lord, I know that you have more of this to make real in my life. Will you show me why you can't? Will you show me? Holy Spirit, you are the counselor that Jesus has sent to me. Will you reveal to me in what deep, deep way I am not willing to die to myself. Holy Spirit, will you show me in what way I am still serving two masters? Show me deep, deep down, deep beyond even the level of the pride and the anger and the jealousy. Show me, Lord, show me it so plainly that I will no longer be able to hold out against it. Holy Spirit, will you show me? That's so different from introspection. I think a lot of us just proclaim our sinfulness again and again because we say to ourselves, now, I know I've been crucified with Christ. I know this old self has been completely renewed. I know the old creation has been blotted out and everything is new, but it's not real in every part of my life. So I'd better start thinking, now, why is it not real? Now, I see that I was, I had jealousy yesterday. I see that. And do you see that you're, crucifying Christ afresh. You're treating him as a person who isn't present. You're grieving the Holy Spirit because you're virtually saying, now, listen, get out of the way and let me, let me get down to this. Now, now keep out of it. I, I know you have something to do, but, but I have to think this thing through. And you're really grieving the dear Spirit. And what you need to do is receive Jesus' words and say, Holy Spirit, you're the counselor. And you alone can.